we found the way to fix the audio, hopefully, and a brief history of power with two white guys talking about eventually the Ottoman Empire. But really, right now, we're going to talk about Delaware because as Wayne and Garth taught me as a good, upstanding, hopeful young man, uh, learning of the Midwest from the California portrayal of it as, uh, as I grew up in San Diego, um, Delaware, what's in Delaware? And they made fun of it. I thought, yeah, that's right. It's in Delaware. There's stupid people over there. Probably they're all dumb because I'm in California. And I'm awesome like that and, and cool. And, and let's watch <laughs> movies and stuff. And then uh, as, a, as a young pastor, I was serving in New Jersey, which is not Newark. Um, it is a forest of farmland and, and horses with lots of wealthy people, not concrete. It's the Garden State. And my mom was visiting, and, and she's a nice lady. She had the kids, and she was on the freeways, and she ended up taking the wrong turn. And it's like a, this one point where if you don't go the right way on the freeway, it's forever. And you're in Delaware when you're done. <laughs> That's what That's she right. did. So she got to Delaware once. I never got there, right? Because it's a mytholo- mythological place of boring and nothing. <laughs> Although it seems to be there was a laptop that got picked up Somewhere in Delaware? Was that what it was? Was it really close? That's to Delaware? right. Yeah. Well, it's you got it. How'd that happen? What, what's this? A laptop? What? I don't. I don't really know how that happened, and I don't know what the FBI is going to do with Hunter Biden's laptop. Um, the evidence that most people are paying attention to, like most news stories, if they're allowed to hear about it, is evidence about you know salacious images and uh, horrible sexual things that Hunter Biden did. Um, I think the significance of Hunter Biden. Uh, as well as Joe Biden is much bigger. Now, whether by the time uh, most of the people um, are listening to this, whether the election has been called even, or if we're going to go full banana republic and, you know, we won't get results for two months or something. something. I have no idea. But um, the significance of Hunter Biden's laptop as well as his life is wrapped up in, in, I think, this little factoid which is that his father, Joe, has been in Congress uh, representing Delaware for close to half a century. And in that time, not a whole lot has gotten done um, either for Delaware or, or by Joe Biden generally, but the Biden family has become a lot richer. Really? <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, like I'm, many I'm, political I'm families. I'm flabbergasted. I'm sure there's a thumbs down coming <laughs> soon just for that comment. I mean, how can you say such a thing uh, as as that? Why is that important? This is a show about, um, well, no, this is a show about politics and power in the past. And so neither religion or politics should come into it. And you right. clearly like Trump and are part of the cult. Mm, and I'm not yeah. going further in this conversation. Right. Okay. Well, that's... That's that's totally fine. Enjoy enjoy being brain dead, you know. But it's like, um, oh, now they say they can't see you. What? The devil oh, doesn't no. want us to do this. You're right. You're right. You're there. You're missing. Hold on. This will be easy to fix. I think. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Here it is. Here it is. It's coming right here, like this. They could hear you. Keep going. Okay. Um, is that uh, the Bidens are kind of emblematic of Delaware, uh, in that uh, Delaware is a place that the decadent American empire uses uh, for its own purposes. So Delaware's significance is purely legal. Like if it didn't actually exist, (laughs) it wouldn't matter. It just needs to exist legally because Hunter Biden's first job was with MBMA, uh, MBNA, uh, a credit card company. And Delaware is a place that if you want to, uh, you can headquarter as a corporation, you get very favorable tax treatment, you get very favorable legal treatment. Um, people like Hunter Biden that have law degrees from elite institutions are going to help you with this. But what you can really do, especially if you're a credit card company, is charge enormous rates. Uh, what used to be called usury, uh, both legally and theologically, usury, uh, that's off the table in Delaware. So if you want to headquarter in Delaware and you want to charge people, you know, 78% on their credit card. You can bonded, do that. bonded servitude levels. <laughs> might, might it be yeah. bonded servitude? Is, is, is it kind of, I mean, 99.9% of my life, the rest of my life, would that count? I mean, can we, can we get there? You think we get there? Maybe, maybe in a hundred years. It's the groundwork for it, right? Uh, it's the groundwork for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's I, the groundwork for slavery. And if we don't see that, you want whoever you vote for, I don't care. You need to see this. They're financially going to yeah. put us in slavery in hundred years. They're working on it. Come on. Right. Golly. Yeah. Well, so and I you, you can. <laughs> I don't you, care. you can see that dynamic going on. Um, the World Economic Forum just put out a little video, very short, 
predicting, you know, what are things going to be like? Those are the folks that, that host Davos, uh, which is kind of a gathering of world leaders every January. Um, little video, and it says, by 2030, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. And then there's a guy smiling. And the significance of that is that everything is going to turn into a subscription service, which is both more precarious for you, but it's also easier to take away, right? So if you're, for instance, I mean, this happens right now with things that are ostensibly free, but if you rely on, you know, your YouTube channel or your Twitter account or whatever you have, basically for your livelihood, if that gets taken away because they don't like what you're saying, then that's already a financial problem. Yeah. What they can do is extend more and more and more realms of life to precarious situations in which if you do or say the wrong thing or you have the wrong opinions, it can easily be taken away. If I give up my Amazon Prime subscription, which I almost did, but I didn't, and here's why. If I give up my Amazon Prime subscription because I'm really tired of letting Bezos do politically whatever he is, because it's got to be bad because I'm on that side and I think that kind of stuff because I'm a conspiracy mm -hmm. theorist. Uh, so I'm not going to give him my 100 bucks a year, and that'll show him. Um, if I do that, then yeah. suddenly I have to pay for shipping on like – Maybe I won't buy as much, but I'm probably going to have to pay more for shipping next year just to get the 12 or 15 things from small name online stores, not now in the street, online stores that are in competition, mm -hmm. yeah. and I can't afford to do it. So I held there on to go. Prime. Right. I'm owned. Right. Or exactly. I give up my lifestyle. What will I give up? That's the real question, and that's the real vote. Go where <laughs> you want to go. I'm just talking. So... um. So what, what you see in a family like the Bidens is this attitude uh, that over that time, it's not like uh, crime rates or anything has actually gone down or things have gotten, life has actually gotten objectively better for the majority of Delaware's population necessarily. Hmm. Uh, and if you actually live there, implying it's real and you want to write in and tell me, you know, uh, no, you're totally wrong. You don't understand. I'm happy to be corrected. Um, but what has happened over the last 47 years is that the Bidens have gotten wealthier. It's also significant that somebody like Hunter Biden, you know, he's being portrayed in the media as kind of like, wouldn't you want to help your son who had kind of failed at life and blah, 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 blah. A lot of the kind of obvious public details about his life, even prior to what's on his laptop are not being discussed. But let's just discuss the fact that he goes to Georgetown uh, for undergrad and Yale for law school. And uh, those are both uh, elite institutions. And so our elite institutions produce what? They produce people who are relatively good at working within the system, as he has been. He hasn't necessarily accomplished anything in his life. Objectively, he didn't write a book or pass a law or even really raise a coherent family, as it turns out. Um, and whatever's on that laptop, there's a lot about family uh, in there and what's been released. Go ahead. Yeah. Sy systemic leeches is sort of the yeah. vocation. And in the ancient world, they would have called it, as historians 100 years ago called this, the priestly class. It's the priests. Uh, that they, they don't do anything, but make the system magically do what it does, keep letting me stand here with my holy ordination upon me. And I say that as one ordained in, in, in the Trinitarian mm. faith, but um, there is uh, there's systemic leeches and there is a religiousness to this, uh, I think, historically. Yeah, I mean, I well, I they are leeches. I would identify them if you're going to use like a, like a caste system. I think they're more like a merchant class or a warrior class, not in the sense that they're doing battle necessarily, but that they are they are making the gears turn within the system. I think our priests are generally the media and academia, right? Now, okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, a family like the Bidens are not necessarily interpreting reality for people the way like BuzzFeed or um, something like that is going to do, yeah. but they, they, they do make the gears turn in the system. So that's why Hunter Biden's business dealings include China and Ukraine and other places, um, also interactions with the Obama family, which probably will never be kind of explained by anyone particularly um, before, during, and after the Obama administration. So I think what, what's going on there is that they're serving a go-between role 
especially in the case of Ukraine, especially a go-between between the American ruling class or elites um, and other economies and their elites, right? And I say economies for, the, for a very specific reason that uh, the Bidens are very much Delaware. Like I, I can identify all the places in the Biden articles about Hunter or Joe because I live there and it's a small place. It's very geographically specific. However, if it didn't actually exist in like space time, it wouldn't matter because the significance for them of a place like Delaware, and I think bigger than that, the significance of a place like America for them is simply that legally and financially it exists. The geography of the place and the people who spend their lives there that don't have access to all this stuff, these connections, these bank accounts, those people are kind of irrelevant. And that's why functionally in the careers of families like this, the average person who lives in Delaware or the average American who goes to work every day, whether he lives in Delaware or Illinois or wherever, really doesn't matter in their calculations, right? So I think what's significant is that our elites are in what I think is, is a looting stage, right? Yeah. Where they can perceive that what's really going to be beneficial to them and theirs is not to work practically in the interests of the people that ostensibly they're representing. It's really just to get what is available for their own family. Yeah, I think this really clicked for me recently. Uh, you, you and I had a conversation and I, like all good fools, want to find a single head on, on the beast. And it, it, it clicked that the real attempt is by Americans to enter the world elite as families. Mm -hmm. Now that they yeah. see they can. Yeah. And that really qu wasn't even quite there before. Uh, and even in Washington's ability, although I don't know. I mean, where are Jefferson's kids now? What is their last name? I don't know. But you might. Uh, the point being, again, these families are going beyond, okay, I can I can have this office. I can do this thing. I can make the republic yeah. live. And it's like, oh, look, there's kings and more kings and lots of kings. And I have as much money and power. Oh, hmm. what if I set that up differently when I leave? I wonder what I could do. And you do that together for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And you yeah. get it, you get that thing bunkered into, I don't know, conspiracy theory places that don't have conspiracy theories. Uh, right. What happens? So I don't know. I mean, shoot me. Uh. Well, I, I think that the dynamic has been going on for a long time. Um, something in which the Biden family is actually unusual among our elites today is that um, Hunter's brother, who was kind of objectively... Um, better at keeping his life together um, and uh, was Bo. And Bo, uh, rather unusually for our elites, both served in the military and died. Oh, wow. Um, and so, and I remember when that happened and I remember when and where his funeral was and, and can everything you, can like you that. Can tell a little bit about that? Like what was the circumstances of the death? That's, that's um, I, be I believe he died in like on deployment, like in combat. Wow. God bless the man. Yeah, well, it's it's very unusual because I think one thing you can notice about our elites is that, um, and, and you can see this if you go into the chapel of a boarding school in the Northeast or uh, a chapel at an Ivy League university or, or, or some sort of similar institution, Stanford, Duke, you will find listed, depending on how old the institution is, big plaques with names of alumni from the boarding school or the college, from the revolution, from War of 1812, Mexican War, Civil War, uh, and, and so on down the line. And even for some of what you now probably think of like as the most left-wing institutions, you'll still find plenty of names of alumni who died in combat uh, from the Second World War. The numbers will go way down for Vietnam, although they might still be there. They probably are practically non-existent for things like the wars we've been fighting for the past roughly going on 20 years. So what you can see is that usually over time, our elites have disengaged from the things that most Americans are expected to engage in. Uh, there were drafts for the First World War, Second World War, and Vietnam, as well as Korea. Um, and so most Americans have been in those things. Uh, for the past 20 years, you're largely dealing with overwhelmingly rural or urban Americans being in the military, especially in combat arms. We've talked about what the demographics of combat arms are, um, the elites are generally not there. They're generally absent from those things. So you can see a kind of uh, a, di uh, a diversion forming 
between how our elites spend their lives and how average Americans spend their lives. And in the case of like the Biden family, you see it even between the two brothers. Now, Hunter, the only thing that I knew about Hunter until about a month ago was that Hunter had slept with Bo's widow um, pretty like early on after his brother's death. And so uh, that was kind of a scandal and that broke up his first marriage. And he's, his, his life is kind of a mess. And, and, and for that, I really just feel bad for him. Um, exactly. However, right. However, I think you can see between the two brothers, kind of the whole spectrum of activities. You get this in a family, like you can see it also in the Bush family. Um, the Bushes started out as kind of um, servants of uh, a, a big railroading family nobody remembers anymore called the Harrimans. And they rose from there into Connecticut politics. So the, the first Bush who was president actually served in combat in the Second World War. The second Bush who was president uh, was in the Texas Air National Guard during Vietnam, which meant he didn't, didn't have to go to combat. And his brothers are, as far as I'm aware, uh, do not have any combat service. Hey, real quick, we got a couple of comments saying that Bo died yeah. of brain cancer. Does that? There you go. That's right. I'm sorry. He was in the military. He died of brain cancer. Okay, but I, he did serve. I was wrong. He did serve. He did serve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And if anyone yeah. knows if he served active duty, I would like to know because I want to give my hat tip to him if he did. And if yeah. you did, keep going. So I think um, when you're talking about what's going on with... Um, with our elites, I think what you see is a progression from contribution to the national welfare, also in the hardest aspects of that when the nation is at war. And gradually over time, that's gonna decline into, um, there's a vast difference in just the course of life between someone who is elite and someone who is not. Um, I think the dynamic that that creates is also like in the case of somebody like Kamala Harris, her family on both sides it has not been in America for any great length of time time. Uh, um, so what's going to happen is that in order for her to rise, um, she's going to have to imitate the elites, live like the elites, live with the elites. And so to do that, she's not necessarily going to end up serving the country um, because that's not something that the elites do anymore. So it's also sort of self-perpetuating. Whereas if it were necessary to be elite that you had to serve in the military or whatever other sort of sacrificial thing was normative in our country, uh, then that would be required also if your family had, you know, basically just gotten here. So when, when she was asked why she would be the running mate of a man who she had accused of sexual misconduct during the Me Too explosion <laughs> yeah, right. in the, in the pre-debates, and her answer was, ha, 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 that was a debate. Yeah, ha, ha, right. ha, ha. She wasn't right. really thinking that was a strange thing to say. She actually thought, don't you know that we're just shouting at each other the worst insults we can? That's all we're doing? Right. Don't you know that? Yeah, right, right, right. That they right. think that's normal. I'm not trying right. to accuse her of being malicious. I mean, well. I'll let you make that judgment, right? But, but anyway, the point <laughs> being, right? I don't have a thing for her particularly. The yeah. entire system is corrupt. Oh, I, I don't want to be Rosh Al Ghul. I'm not Rosh Al Ghul. Goodness gracious. Don't be Rosh Al Ghul. But is that bad, Batman? It's that bad. So deal with it. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, her family um, uh, on her mother's side, uh, the Indian side, so she's. She's Jamaican and Indian. On the on the Indian side, her family is fairly prominent um, in the way that usually families are prominent in Indian politics, which is by being of a certain racial caste. Can I? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get really like incendiary here and ask. Okay. Um, so, in the white noise, there was the argument that she is not quote capital B black end quote, and we'll just leave it at that yeah. because Jamaican is not now. I'm curious if you'll tread in on <clears throat> first, don't straw man anybody like both sides of that argument. Like what's yeah. their real argument. And then yeah. uh, I'd be really curious if you had an opinion, but we don't even need to know that. I just want to know what their real, both positions that would say she's black or not black. I don't think it's just white people shouting about this. Right. Yeah. I think there's yeah. actual an ethnic fight going on. Um, right. I'm curious well, what it is. Okay. I, I think the reason the fight is going on is because there's actually benefits to be gained by identifying as black, right? So contrary to what you're told, it's actually of enormous financial benefit potentially to a person. And certainly within the elites, it's still more valuable because you have set asides in every elite institution of any kind, if especially if you're black, but if you just are non-white in some way. 
So, so why would someone consider Jamaican not black though? That's what I don't understand. Like, where okay, does that come and from? yeah, and 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 that's especially tricky because it's 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 Caribbean black, which means that there is a history of slavery. But the distinction being made is that you are not an American descendant of slaves. ADOS, ADOS acronym, is is what's used, and hmm. so therefore you don't deserve what we have coming to us because of our historical experience of not simply being of African descent, but of having experienced American slavery. Oh, so by being Caribbean black, there's not necessarily slavery in the history. Is that the idea? Because there, there are slaves there too. The Caribbean exists as part of the, the trade. I mean, well, the distinction is not really made for the sake of parsing what happened in the Caribbean versus North America. It's really made between um, native-born American blacks yeah. and African immigrants. That's what I don't. That's what I don't understand. But that's just because I'm a white guy, so you can ignore me and go on and talk about how a Jamaican married an Indian, lived in Canada, and then their daughter ends up marrying like the mayor of San Francisco, and now she's the VP candidate. It's great. It's, it's the American dream, people. Right. Well, I, I think it is I think, actually kind of. I mean, really. I guess. I guess. I mean, I don't. I don't think I believe in the American. No, you I think don't. I be- you don't. You no, don't. I don't. So you no. can at least acknowledge that it is the American dream. There you go. <laughs> Um, I, and I think something that is underneath that debate is uh, animosity and enmity between different groups of people of African descent living in the modern United States. And that's simply not something that generally gets discussed because in the media, right? So our priestly class generally frames everything as white or non-white, um, which is both simpler and easily told. And the public education system is designed around it. Around it's telling historically America- what was there in majority making things for a long time and it just kind of left the footprint well what i'm what i'm saying is what that way of telling things does is it it masks any conflict Mm. among groups that are not white including among people of the same race but not the same history or ethnicity however you want to discuss that and so it doesn't tell you why Ghanaian immigrants might completely despise native-born american blacks but this is a conflict that one finds if you have any acquaintance with those communities living together. So um, that that's the issue with with Kamala Harris and the idea of being black uh, is something that she wants precisely because it is of immense benefit in modern America. Hmm. Okay. Um, now that was an interruption I sent into you talking about Harris for a different reason and talking about. Uh, the path to elitism that she was on. Yeah, um, right. But we can shove back anywhere. Well, I think I think the significance is that the, because our elites are not attuned to sacrificial behavior, they're they're attuned to being in the right institutions. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, I think, is the first non Ivy League trained Supreme Court justice in a long time, and it's not as if Notre Dame Law School is you know, kind of a night school or something. So I'm not sure how non-elite Notre Dame actually is at this point. Um, but uh, Elite enough for handmaids to hang out there, that's for sure. It's, it's yeah, I think it's, I think it's probably plenty elite. And so um, you want to get into the right institutions and you want to make those connections and live that kind of life that does not necessitate something like military service or even practical acquaintance with uh, the daily working life of the people that you're going to go on to represent politically. So we got a comment real quick that, and uh, fact check this on, uh, you know, this is coming from the side, but I think mm-hmm. this is what I did here is that Harris's grandfather owned slaves. So she actually is Canadian, wow. uh, uh, Caribbean black on the wrong side of the equation, however, um, and uh, has been recorded as laughing about it, uh, which I would believe. But then again, you can fake everything because Thanos, man, he was sweet. Uh, please keep going on your topic. <laughs> so I think, um, I think I I, th- I think that what also something that gets something that gets masked within our elites is not only like well okay what is their actual relationship to the people they're supposedly representing, but also um, who are they right? So also if Harris is able to present as black and to affect a certain accent and you you can see this with um, like the Obamas right? So oh, her Barack favorite Obama- rapper well, it was I know Tupac she know Tupac was dead that was that. Was- Sorry. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and condemn anyone for lacking pop culture knowledge. I'm sorry. I know. But but there's there is like what I grew up without rap. Mm-hmm. I didn't listen to it. I heard of Tupac because he got shot. It's a big deal. It's massive. It impacted everything. And yeah. I mean, you were reading books in an apartment in Philadelphia 
when this stuff was going down and it was it was you know you were doing vigil so you missed some things. there you go the, like but, to not know to to i don't know what do you think about this then i'm, sh- I'm shifting we'll come back to yeah, where you were sure. but like the in the news this week again was the whole coyote thing which uh coming from california i was like how do you not know that a coyote is the the their term the, you know the, the hispanic term, right. latino term the for, runner for the one who can get you through the hills without getting caught he's it's a good yeah. term not a negative term and, and right. like you're, they make oh so that's the same kind of thing with tupac though and so if you're going to say to the american people that that you're you're black and this is a white guy just observing what it looks like from the outside like she's saying she's black and mm-hmm. then everyone's mad about it and there's a question and she yeah. goes you know who's your favorite rapper who's your living rapper living rapper tupac yeah yeah, so I mean, you know, wh- you're not one of us. You're not one of us. You're not one of if any he- of us down here because you don't watch any of it. Like you, Adam, you're intellectually the elite, right? But they they live that way because it's just a different planet. I think, I mean, with somebody like Obama, whose background is, you know, like it, it's very disparate. Um, his family is kind of has spread him over different parts of the world. Hmm. He didn't really know his dad growing up. This kind of thing. Um, a person like that, I, I feel like there's a lot of confusion built into that kind of life. It's like your parents being from two different places and you grow up in a third country. That's kind of hard for anybody, right? Yeah. What you can see with both Harris and Obama, um, less so with Michelle Obama, because her family are American black, indubitably on both sides. But with Barack Obama and Kamala Harris is their accent changes drastically depending on who they're talking to. I want to note the same thing happens with Hillary Clinton and to a lesser extent with Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton is somebody whose accent, natural accent, uh, poor Arkansas white, simply was insufficiently prestigious for Georgetown and after that Oxford. Hmm. And so he's going to code switch. What you have are elites who are constantly code switching depending on the audience they're talking to. So what I'm saying is that a system like this where... The elites are decided not by, okay, I I went to Yale and like my father, I went into a law firm on Washington, but we both had to serve in the Navy in order to even get a job because that's what you do. So the elite is formed with some, I'm not saying they were angels, but some sense of duty toward the nation. Skin in the game. Skin in the game. That's it. When when you don't have that, what you're going to have are instead the people who are best, not even at public speaking, because Kamala Harris's public speaking presentation is dreadful. I think as somebody who talks publicly she's a for a living, she's a harpy. She, she's not, she's not good. She presents as give me Hillary, just alternately condescending. And okay. Um, she is very good at saying and being how others want her to be. So what I can see is that our system is optimizing for that. Joe Biden, when he first got elected, you know, was a relatively conservative Catholic Democrat. Okay. Now he's saying, okay, uh, if you're eight years, years old and you figured out you were another sex, go for it. Let's go with the hormone blockers. Let's get this process started. So what you can see is that when the system is built basically for looting, you get people who are good at looting and good at changing their disguises in order to loot more effectively. They will become whoever they need to be. Uh, Kamala Harris is the bad guy in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and that should sum it up for everybody. Let's get back to the laptop and try to tie it a little bit to the Ottoman Empire. Okay. I mean, the laptop is also uh, has become a sort of football within the government. And to these things, we're not really privy, which is similar to what happens with Ottoman government. Um, And I'll discuss the Ottomans in a second. But what you can see is that the FBI may or may not actually investigate what's in there. And if they do that, then they may or may not do anything about what's on there. You had a similar thing with Anthony Weiner. Um, in relationship to the Clintons during the last electoral cycle. So what you also have when this, when the elite and its institutions, including the government, are completely disconnected from the population they're supposed to be serving, um, is that government becomes completely opaque. And I've talked about that before in terms of, you know, democracies always run this risk because the nature of power in democracy is necessarily a little bit abstract because it's the people. And unless the thing is really small, 
I can't see the people all at once. I can't see every voter at once, okay? Um, whereas the fewer people you have running things openly in the system, um, basically the more transparent you get. That may be good, that may be bad, but at least you know who's in charge. If I can get in the room with you. Yeah, yeah, right. Keeps you and, accountable. So right. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not right. that guy. I don't think that's right. But I'll say that conscience is a thing. You know, we want to live survival. You need you need a um, uh, a reason to do things. Skin of the game again. Uh, Nassim Tlaib can't recommend that book highly enough. Okay, so keep going. So so what you have with the Ottomans who are and I'm bringing them up basically because they're a non-European historical empire and a and a post power. They yeah, and they are they are a power that everyone knows fell apart. Um, they collapsed in and after the First World War. Um, and caused it, really, by their collapse, sort of inadvertently, were used for it, were the catalyst of it. I, I would say that the, their loss of power and internal sickness created the opportunity for strife in the Balkans, and that, right. that precipitated Texas, the... Texas, California, Chicago have to figure out who's in charge. Oh, not yeah. quite, but kind of. Right. So um, what happens with the Ottomans is that they don't transfer to a dem to an even purportedly democratic form of government ever. But what does happen is that the government prog becomes progressively more opaque over time. Yeah. So you move from like when they conquered Constantinople in 1453, uh, the man in charge is actually the guy who is in charge and commands things um, to by the time of the early 20th century, uh, they they are both not sure who they are, and it's not really clear who's actually in charge, even within their own territory, right? So I, I, I remember the first time that I found out that, um, like, national parks, not to speak of the border, but that national parks, most of which are in the Western United States, um, parts of them were being controlled by assorted Mexican cartels, um, just basically to grow... Um, various things. Um, when I found that out, I was, I was initially like, this is really strange. That's really, really strange. But it's not actually historically unusual because what happens, I think, as an empire that, and because empires always have all different kinds of people inside them, those people have different interests. Once they realize being interested in the empire centrally is really not that good for them, and there's not a whole lot of a future there, they're going to invest in other things. Mm. So by the time the Ottoman Empire is falling apart, part of the reason that you get um, so much violence in its collapse is because you have a lot of different groups trying to seize various kinds of power for themselves as they see centralized power slipping away. So just in the collapse of the Ottomans, you have strife among the Turkish people themselves over what it means to be Turkish. And the group that comes to power, the Young Turks, start out um, as uh, secularizing figures, and they make radical changes um, among the Turkish people in the 1920s after they come to power. The reason they can do that is precisely because the people who used to hold power, who were more devoutly Muslim, um, who used actually a different alphabet, that's how much they changed being Turkish, uh, who thought women should be covered up in traditional Muslim dress, that elite was completely eclipsed by the collapse of their state. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see just with the collapse of the Ottomans in Turkey itself, life changed drastically within a matter of 10 years because the elite had been so thoroughly discredited by a combination of economic loss and destruction and military loss and destruction. Hmm. In addition to that, you also have the not just the Armenian genocide, but also war between Armenians and Turks. You have population transfers moving Greek Christians into what is now Greece and Muslims out of what is now Greece and parts of North Macedonia. Is that like Turkey. concentration camps? I mean, is that, I mean, uh, <laughs> not, no, okay, kind not, of, it's, 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 it's kind of. It's yeah. forced removal. It's forced migration. Yes. It's kind of forced like, migration. Like let's yeah. take all 
let's let's do this as 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 bad an idea as I come up with. Let's take every Jew in the entire world and force them to go to Israel and lose all their stuff as they go. It's kind of like that, right? Okay. Yeah? So yeah, the 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 absolute and it's it's weird how this is talked about because it's it's not only that people don't know anything about the Ottomans, and if you are an American, I would recommend knowing things about them. Uh, because their empire was very large and multi-ethnic and kind of weak and subject to foreign depredation, <laughs> just like ours. Um, but it's weird how in the case of the Ottomans, and I found this also with a lot of other non-European empires, historians will use really neutral terms. So they won't talk about concentration camps, a term that's usually first used for what the British did to the Boers in South Africa. And then later on in the 20th century by various European powers, including of course the, the Third Reich. They'll use the term population exchange, which I guess technically you could call it that, but it's really, it's a, it's a move of people from Smyrna in Southwestern Turkey into Greece, mm. simply because they're ethnically Greek Christians. Yeah. So the Ottomans were able bureaucratically to hold all these groups together in those places for five, you know, 500 years about after they took over what remained of Byzantium. But it's still but, that, that, that meant yeah. though, again, for all these people groups and as they're doing this, this means forcible removal, remo moving. I mean, like a majority yeah. of the population of this empire is not really living their best life now. Let's, let's kind of leave it at that. Yeah. No, no, not at all. Because yeah. you have to, you have to restart your life there yeah. uh, some, somewhere else. So that's, and that's, that's largely about what's going on in Anatolia with Armenians, Greeks, Turks. Elsewhere in the empire, you also have European powers saying, hey, look, they used to control a bunch of stuff, including, not coincidentally, places that we're now finding out, early 1920s, we're now finding out, uh, you know, have enormous oil reserves. Hmm. Let's get going, right? And so a lot of the shape, uh, you know, literally on a map, the shape of the modern Middle East is because the British and the French especially divvy up control over the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, in view of Ottoman collapse. People are watching what's going on in a decadent empire with economic resources, right? So let's say that the United States, as uh, a billboard I saw recently outside Chicago, no, just, just warns- Just real fast, real fast. Up. I yeah, want to come billboard outside Chicago. How do Britain and France tie to the Ottomans officially? They'd be just basically uh, parties in alliance with them, right? Is that correct? Britain and France are victors in the First World War. So you're talking post-World War right now. I was thinking pre-World War. What is Britain and France's relationship to the Ottoman Empire? Their relationship is largely predatory. The only European power that really supported the Ottoman state and wanted it to survive in any kind of way was the were the, the Germans. The rising Germans. And the rising German power... Uh, of uh, sport, so basically, so Germany is seeing that there is a shell of a dying empire, and they realize that if they can get inside that shell and prop it up long enough, it gives them time to build long enough to compete with the other option for after that empire falls. That okay, that that's part of it. <laughs> it's uh, World War One after all. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> the other, the other part of it, which no one really sort of like remembers, is that Germans. Uh, were, I, I think, uh, relative to British and French, uh, and this extends with everything from scholarship to foreign policy, generally more accepting of non-European cultures and ways. Hmm. And so, for instance, when um, Kaiser Wilhelm II goes to the tomb of Saladin, who defeated the Crusaders, um, he mourns the fact that the Muslims are not doing a better job of keeping up the memory of Saladin, and uh, he's willing to help pay to have his tomb refurbished. Hmm. When the French uh, come to the same tomb uh, after being victorious in the Middle East in the First World War, uh, the French general who comes to Saladin's tomb says that this is the revenge of the of the Frankish armies of Christ. <laughs> you know, so well, and you know what? So, I, yeah. I, I, th I, I don't think that's the right decision to make historically at that point in World War One. But I also understand that the entire French and Spanish history has a history of war with Muslims. South, a Turk, not Turk, but yeah, right, Muslims that are not Turks. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, religion does come into play in this, not because the religion or 
necessarily says so, but just because people on both yeah. sides have this as their history and uh, and confuse it. And that's this show. I mean, uh, uh, someone who I respect didn't like some of what we were saying earlier. And I'm gonna say right here, like, this show is about recognizing it's all the same game. And 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 the sure. the thing at the heart of this is that the the smoke screen has to be pierced, right? You have to see what's really going on on the ladder being climbed, which brings me back to uh, the um, uh, the billboard, right? Because they don't have billboards in the Ottoman yeah. Empire, but we're gonna come yeah. back to the Ottoman Empire. This is about seeing how it's nothing's different right now. Nothing. Well, the right the billboard outside Chicago, um, right off to ninety, I want to say. Um, it's either that or 294 asks the question in big white letters on a red background, will the United States split into two different countries? And um, in answer to that question, I would look at the Ottomans and say, Who probably paid? not. Who paid for that? I, I have no idea. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. Que that bono, it's there que bono yeah, man. Yeah, que I, bono. Don't know. <laughs> I don't really know in that Golly. case, but I, but I think what you, what you can, what you can see with the Ottomans is that, um, it fractures along all kinds of lines. Some of them can be seen and sort of predicted this was going to happen uh, before the thing falls apart. Um, some of them could not necessarily. So a country that eventually forms out of the ruins of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire that is definitely strengthened, but doesn't come into existence, but its cause is strengthened by the collapse is modern day Israel. Um, because uh, Jewish immigration is really going to flourish after the First World War um, in what's, what's under British control. Um, but because of the Jewish diaspora in Britain and, and their capacity to operate, um, the Jewish population is going to increase rapidly after the First World War. And that's, that's going to strengthen what's going to come to be Israel in 1947. So when you're looking at an, uh, an empire falling apart, um, I, I don't know that it can really ever split into two. That that model assumes that there are two power centers opposed to each other. And it seems to me that inside an empire, it's much more likely that you have multiple power centers of different kinds, multiple different interest groups, and they're going to go their separate ways. So I, I mean, I, I don't, I am not a prophet, right? Like this is just me playing risk with dystopic, sad, my actual life, like Chicago, Texas, the other side of the Rockies, California is kind of like a little more Latino than, say, Seattle. So you kind of got two yeah. things going on there with money right. up in British Columbia running things, maybe. And then you have the eastern seaboard where, you know, the queens and kings in Delaware or whatever. Um, that just seems to be like the, the, the heat sinks of power. But Atlanta's ready to go like like uh, solo on its own the moment the Sons of Ham rise, I think, uh, as well. But no one's ready for that one. So maybe LeBron James. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. The point, but you got you got. So that's like I'm just spitballing a game, right? Yeah. Like, but you see these big powers with certain identities and agendas that while they might overlap against, say, Trump, although they don't with Texas necessarily. Uh, you know what? What uh, Kentucky be another great spot in a sense. They don't overlap. They might overlap in, in the event of a national election. Their their goals do not overlap in the in the long term elites' goals for that place. Um, yeah. And uh, the people who live there are invested in that, and they're the ones you can actually talk to. Uh, those are yeah. the people trying to climb the ladder into that other game we're talking about. Whether or not you believe it exists, there's people on the ground who want in, <laughs> and they're called mayor. Yeah, uh, keep going. And I, I, I think that the other thing that makes this unpredictable, not just how many fragments will there be, is that, um, as I've said before, I, I do think humanity's majors run the world. Um, you know, the, the Eastern Front on the, you know, in the Second World War is uh, a failed seminary student fighting a failed art student, right? That's Stalin versus Hitler. <laughs> so one thing that happens with the collapse of the Ottomans is that Kemal Ataturk um, is able in Turkey, what becomes Turkey, to forge an identity which is Turkish, but not necessarily Muslim, not religiously or decisively Muslim. It is secular. This is kind of a new thing. Um, certainly in Turkish history, it's a new thing. And so what you really can't predict about the future is, unless you're listening to this and you think, okay, well, what do I want to do? And, and last week I presented what I think is kind of a humbler, more careful and more generally applicable vision. So as I, what I'm about to say is not necessarily directed to, you know, kind of the 
the normal person listening. It would be directed more to the the potential, uh, you know, psychopaths and dictators in the audience, um, which could include both the people on the call. Right, exactly. <laughs> so um, is I that- I, I kid you not, this morning I realized, you know what? I could start a cult. I could do it. I could do it. It'd be very <laughs> successful. I could maybe even go down in a yeah. blaze of fire, but yeah. I don't think I want to. No, it sounds like a bad idea, Jonathan. We don't want to do this. We're going to stick with the game plan, even though you've realized what an evil genius you are. But the thing is, like, whether or not I actually am as good as I think I am, because there's a lot of narcissism in the whole world right now, the fact is there's certain people who rise up to ask certain questions because sure. they're concerned right. about the future, and that's what right. we call a leader. Whether you're good or bad is a different question, right? But you're talking leader talk right now. Right, and so what you can see with Ataturk or um, among the... Um, the Zion, in, among the Zionist forces in, in what will one day be Israel at that time, right after the First World War, you've got Ben-Gurion, you've got Haim Weizmann, is that you have people who are not necessarily asking the question, okay, what was the past like and how can I cope with the fact that it's not there anymore? Hmm. They're not even necessarily worried about, has anyone heard and agreed with all of the stuff that I'm about to say? They basically exercise their capacity to make decisions and to speak in convincing ways for the sake of making groups that largely didn't exist in the past, right? So in the past, in what became Turkey, you didn't necessarily have enormous groups of people saying, hey, I love being Turkish. Uh, I hate the Greeks because they're Greek. No, it was more collected around Ottoman identity, had a lot more to do with being Muslim. Therefore, you hated Greeks because they were Christian, right? Mm -hmm. But Ataturk is like, look, that's a dead end. That's a dead end for being in the modern world. It's not going to bring us to any great national glory. Let's be Turkish. You don't really have to be Muslim. It's not that big of a deal. You don't have to practice much. They do, I think wisely, maintain state control over religion uh, in order to make sure that it comes not to matter that much. You're the advocating that, that in all yeah. cases or just that case? Well, I think politically it's wise. I don't know if it's necessarily like... Let's try to come back to that one for a whole episode sometime. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. Um, I, 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 think, I think, I'll say this, I think politically it's transparent. Uh, the control that, that our system exercises over religion, like almost other form, all other forms of control, is indirect, passive, Absolutely. and uh, Absolutely. none less Absolutely. suffocating. Absolutely. Yeah. I am a monarchist, and the first and only law is you don't ever get in trouble for actually killing the king if you succeed. Yeah. And right. I believe right. that would keep things in line sure. for a good generation and a half. <laughs> okay. Oh, then again, they might be a few generations yeah. real fast, and then it would work right. again for a while. Right. I mean, right. it's better than... World War Three. There you go. I agreed. I agree. Yeah. So anyway, another. We'll do that another time. A monarchy yeah. is a, a, a crazy thing. Religious yeah. wars are a dead end. Is what Ataturk re realized, though. In in you said a modern world. I am so done with the word modern. It's it's industrialized. So the modern, postmodern, whatever it is, there's this event called industrialization, and yeah. both those words are just describing the radical change to physical life. That brought about for all of us on every level from yeah. what we eat to how we work to how we sleep and think and believe seasons exist or don't. Yeah. Yeah. All that yeah. Well, and, and, and the support that still exists in modern day, present day Turkey for what is called as an ideology, this kind of secular uh, Turkish nationalism is called Kemalism after Ataturk. Um, the support for that that still exists is largely uh, urban. Um, so sort of not coincidentally, it's very hard to convince rural people to change their way of life that rapidly. And so the thing that has changed in modern Turkey is that Erdogan, uh, who is kind of in, is sort of a Putin like figure in modern Turkey, was able to yoke together both Turkish nationalism, but yoke it back into being Muslim which has connected him to money, resources, and connections in the broader Muslim world and has made him really politically successful. The support that you still have for secular identity, a kind of post-Ottoman way, uh, exists in urban areas. It's That means they're in for a civil war then. Well, I maybe, I mean, he has been, Erdogan has been extremely effective at stamping out opposition. So that's- Or that's then it means a genocide of Christians then. At some point, well, I mean, they, or, most, or just what, what? I mean, most of them were already gone. Oh, okay. Most of them were already okay. gone. Um, I was under the impression there was a there was a culture that still lived in the no, the nation. 
I mean, to a very small extent, but see, modern Turkey is nothing like sort of pre-American Iraq, uh, which had com- proportionately way more Christians. Okay. I mean, it doesn't okay. anymore, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, so the nationalism there is, I mean, it's all over the planet right now. Brazil's doing it. India's doing it. Uh, Britain is doing it. The Irish never stopped, really. They just were under the thumb really close to the empire there, right? And mm-hmm. is that fractured? Mm-hmm. So is this just the British Empire fractured? And uh, the the result of that was like the U.S. and Russia and China. Uh, and now we're watching that all fracture. Okay. Maybe we're not even as... W- we think it all just kind of happening like now, right? Maybe yeah. we're well behind the curve of the turn. I, I think that... I think that when you see the break, you, because the, the Ottomans are, are only one empire that dies in the First World War. Yeah, um, yeah. The Austro-Hungarian Empire dies, the German Empire dies, the Russian Empire dies. Um, to some extent, the French lose confidence. The Second World War is what kills the British Empire. Mm-hmm. After that, you get replacement by a different kind of an empire. I'm happy to use the word, but it's definitely of a different nature with the Americans. What is unfortunate about that is that if I say, oh, America is like the Ottoman Empire, not only are people not thinking of us as an empire to begin with, it's also hard for them to see how that can be when we don't have a 500 year history or enormous overseas possessions. Like I can't, I can't fly to some place in Southern Africa and they're flying the American flag on all the government buildings. It's, it's an empire of style Yeah, it, and it is priestly. <laughs> Is the priestly caste of the world, and so when I said priestly caste earlier about the elites, I'm talking about on the uh, on the world stage. So the media is the priests for the commoner, but on the world stage, I think you were describing a priestly class. We'll come back to that another time too, if you don't remember what I'm all the way back. That was like so early in the conversation, but th- there is something uh, very magical about this, right? And we talked did a whole episode about that as well. I I think that what I mean, obviously, the American Empire exports American culture. Um, I I don't. I don't, I don't know that that works Look long-term. like me, be like me, talk like me. The gods will smile upon you. That is Americana. Uh, it really is. God bless it. And apple pie too. It's, uh, I mean, we package the Christianity into something uh, swallowable without Christ well, well long ago. And it's turned itself into this, this mold. Um, and our biggest churches still preach it. And the Puritans who abandoned some of it still act like it. Uh, it I don't know. I don't know. Again, I'm the crazy guy. You're the you're the doctor. I I think that uh, I think that viewing understanding our media as a priestly class is helpful because mm-hmm. it makes sense of something like uh, where in the world have Black Lives Matter protests occurred in the past six months? Obviously, throughout the United States, but not necessarily in you know Eastern Turkey or um, you know uh, Kinshasa or uh, in Beijing. They have occurred in places that are subject to American media uh, saturation. And so people in Finland or people in France or people in Britain have opinions about because they are fed information about Black Lives Matter and what's going on in the United States and whether or not Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, you know, a deity of some kind. Um, That's a measure of where and how our priestly class is at least exporting itself effectively. In that way, we differ radically from the Ottomans Hmm. um, because we just have different communication technology. I don't think we differ from the Ottomans in how our elites are behaving Hmm. near the end stage of the thing itself. Which comes back to the looting again. Yeah. Yeah. I think looting is always a sign when it's done, not simply by uh, some average person or a thief who's looking to get rich or something. Um, But when it's done apparently systematically over the course of a career by elites, by people who are as best educated, uh, have as much money as anybody could reasonably expect to have at his disposal throughout the course of their lives, and they're born into it. I mean, Hunter Biden, um, his brother, Bo, were both born into the elites. Their father entered them through being elected. Um, But when you have somebody like that and the, the outcome of his life is a series of things that he's looted. I mean, he was hired to work by MBNA, the credit card company. He was paid 
enormous amounts of money when he was in his twenties. Like fifty what, what, grand a, a month yeah, or whatever what, it is. What what can somebody in I don't his even 20s... know how to spend that? I yeah, bet right. You, I bet you can on Epstein's Island. They they do have property in the U.S. Virgin Islands. You know the Bidens. It's 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 a weird thing, and I still think that somewhere at the very top there's a religious cult running the thing, and so they remain the ultimate priestly caste. Um, but again, we'll do we'll do my crazy later. Um, Ukraine mm-hmm. somehow is connected to this laptop, but the thing is, uh, yeah. Doctor Coons, I really need you to be careful here because there's an election coming up, and we cannot give anyone the impression that it's allowable for an orange man to be considered human. So do not say anything in talking about Ukraine that would yeah. that would in any way harm he yeah. who must not be named. Or even if you don't name him, it still causes problems. Right. Um, I, Ukraine, to my mind, is sort of like thinking about the modern United States or the Ottomans when it collapsed. That is, hmm. it's a piece of an empire that fell apart that is now therefore subject to foreign investment, control, bribery, any number of things. Uh, What the Bidens were there peddling was influence uh, with an especially powerful country that happens to run NATO, the United States. But what happens when your country begins to fall apart is not that everything just goes up in smoke and it's like a nuclear holocaust. What happens is that the things that used to be under your sovereignty, uh, controlled by someone who is speaks the same language as you and sort of understands how you are and has some sympathy with you. Um, now that's gone and you're now subject to whoever can get there and buy it up and sell it off quickly. One of the things I think that is, uh, that is somewhat nightmarish about America is that our elites have been behaving that way in our own country for a very long time. We have a rust belt because they already behave that way with significant parts of the country. Same what families I, sometimes, right? Same families. Um, so they made their money off oil or railroads, and then they hey, dropped hey, all hey, that. Hey, 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 Go eat your, your Fruityos and watch your Happy Man show. And uh, the new the new Super Box is coming out next week, man. It, like, feels real and stuff. Don't pay attention to the real game. <laughs> um, so... The thing that I'm probably uh, most worried about in the future is what kinds of looting we will be subject to. Yeah, because right. Exactly. I'm, I'm so with you, dude. That's the only yeah. reason I care. It's like, okay, I'm going to build a little wall and I want to be nice <laughs> to my neighbors. And if if we're all getting attacked and no yeah. one's here, I need a plan. <laughs> because well because i mean nobody nobody wants to be looted right I mean, and it's happening it's so clearly happening it cannot nobody, be denied it is clearly happening right and so and and that's what happened to the to people living in the former ottoman empire that's what happened to people living in what used to be the soviet union so i think when you think about the future in addition to kind of forming your groups and 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 living in the interest of your family group or your church group or whatever is most important to you in addition to that, you also want to think about how can I, how can I do something for those people, not just to gain things for them in the meantime, but to protect them from looting. I mean, you you have to start thinking, sometimes literally, about how you're not going to be looted. Because if there ain't no police where you live, no, and there, and there's not because they're going to be. I mean, uh, there are, there were riots in Philly last night. I'm sure there will be tonight. Um, uh, because of Walter Wallace's death. And uh, as, as we're recording this, obviously not when this comes out. And what you're thinking is that you could be a black business owner. It was all the way in the West. I mean, almost outside city limits. Uh, the neighborhood's probably 100% black, something close. Um, you're a black business owner. Uh, maybe you had no problem with what happened earlier in the summer, ideologically, but now they are going to burn down your store because it's there. So we're not even at this point, we're not even that's why I'm talking about politics of nature, because at some point this isn't even ideological. It's just like, will I survive? Will I have a livelihood? Will will I be run over by a truck? 
that's what's happening to yeah. people regardless of their race in places that are literally in this case being looted well, my experience in these neighborhoods in philadelphia because i serve there as well in a white neighborhood these aren't the white neighborhoods it's not a white black issue these are some of the most multicultural places on the planet they're the best of america in some cases not always and it's certainly like the best of america as in they got away from tyranny and now they can have a little shop and goodness is better that way and north philadelphia particularly is just a world of that uh and and to think that that's that's the thing that we're going to throw to the wolves so that a elite class can hold on to power because a crybaby spoiled guy wants to like ruin their, their beehive playground or whatever. Uh, and it's just, it's ruining real human lives. And it doesn't, this isn't Trump Biden, but, but it is America. It is, it is the question. What is America? And I think that matters uh, for Christians now, because you mentioned Amy uh, Barrett again, uh, well, life matters. Why would I want to stop looting? Why would I want to protect anything? Because life matters. It's not a one issue to vote on because it's not one issue. It's all the issues. There's no issue that doesn't touch your life. Yeah. A single one. So I, I don't know where we get off on the idea that we can just live as a country where we kill some people, not others, and it's not going to fracture us someday. And if they're using it in some kind of witchcraft cult where they think drinking baby blood is going to give them DNA supercharges for the singularity with some AI from fish stuff in their heads and the computer shoved in, and they're going to jump into superhuman nature because there's weirdos trying stuff like that out there, and they want to make it some religious cult that goes back mm -hmm. hundreds of years to, what, post-Puritan weirdness? I don't know. And the Masons, have you looked into it? It's all scary. The fact is, I don't care in a sense, but I got kids and I got a street and I got neighbors and I got people around me and I care a lot about them. And what I don't want is somebody out there with whatever kook job they think is going to get their life better, destroying here and never even having to come and pay us for it. <laughs> right, we should at least be able to sell our mountains before they take the coal. Thank you very much. Please think, go on. <laughs> yeah, well, I I think I, yeah, we're getting we're getting close to time here. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I think when you when you look at something like abortion or whatever is on Hunter Biden's laptop, the way to understand what's going on is not to look at them the way that the media teaches you to look at information as a source of either fresh outrages or fresh victories or whatever it is. So that you're riding this like dopamine cycle of disappointment and elation. Uh, in order to compare it and to actually learn from history and therefore to have some sense of what you're supposed to be doing as the future approaches ever more rapidly, uh, you want to look at these things as symptoms. What is wrong with a country if it allows itself to kill um, dozens of millions of children, okay, over the span of, you know, uh, 40 years. What 40 kind of blood years. guilt comes on the um, proximity of that land? We'll leave that for another time. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and when you look at, okay, why, why are our elites like this? Why are the people that are in them, in them? Um, I can, I can see what they're like. I can see their personalities. I can see that Joe Biden doesn't really have control over his, expressions and his brain and his self-presentation anymore. So why is he being put forward to run the country? Is that actually even possible? Look at these things as symptomatic. Yeah, right. And then you can see more about what is wrong with the body politic that these are the symptoms it displays. Qui bono, qui bono, who benefits? Is they're not, Harris is not the cause, right? Yeah, Biden's right. not the cause, Trump's not the cause. Uh, there is a greater thing going on, and it has to do with not power corrupting absolutely, but men corrupting the power they get, especially when they have no skin in the game, uh, to keep them honest with it. Uh, Adam and I, Dr. Koontz, uh, we have some skin in the game somewhere. You can hate us a lot if you would like to, or you can go and get this podcast as a podcast. You can search for A Brief History of Power on uh, any podcast uh, thing you're looking at, like iTunes, whatnot. You should be able to find us there, along with all the other bonus content that's that. Whether we'll do a live video every week and just always have it ahead, it kind of depends on how the sound turned out today, honestly, um, and we'll go from there. But uh, Adam, thank you for your time. We're not yep. done with the Ottoman Empire at all. You can't not talk about World War I and in a brief history of power. Well, it's going to take a little while. We'll catch y'all on the other side and that needs to go